Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building brands, businesses, and a career you love with the people who've done it. I'm your host, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into today's story of starting over. Welcome to the show, Business Builder. I am very happy to bring you another story of a brave human creating their own thing. And there are just so many ways that we can get started on said thing. And it seems like often we hear stories of someone going out on their own after a major event, something that leads a person to leave a stable corporate career and create something of their own. Then there's the other stories, the ones experienced more often than we think. It's the stories of realizing that you're just done with whatever you're in. Things are okay, maybe even great. Maybe there's a growth trajectory in your career, but a thought just comes into your mind that maybe you're just finished. And there's no other choice but to throw yourself into something new. My guest today, the endlessly articulate Ben Willis, lawyer, founder, and managing director of Willis Commercial, will share with you his moment and what happened next. We talk about what it means to have someone in your corner telling you, yes, of course, you should start your own thing, how incredibly important that is, and maybe that you could be that person for somebody as well the realities of moving from business concepts to business admin, allowing yourself to build your uniqueness into what you do, and how it feels when the wins are yours and yours alone as as well as the grind and the not so good bits naturally. Here's the thing they don't tell you about starting an interview format podcast and perhaps it's something on your to-do list as well. Sometimes you'll get to have conversations with people you know. And you'll be able to connect on a far deeper level than you ever would have in any general interaction. This episode happens to be one of those for me. See, Ben and I, we worked together when I was in the world of radio advertising. But when I say work together, I mean, we were in the same organization. We had occasional interactions. Luckily, I didn't have too many run-ins with the legal department in that gig, but there are a few. But I always enjoyed his energy and the way he showed up consistently as himself. That energy is very much still there. So I know you're going to love my chat with Ben. I'm here with the wonderful Ben Willis, founder and managing director of Willis Commercial, a boutique legal firm offering tailored strategic advice to clients while dispensing the theatrics of traditional legal practices. Ben left the world of top-tier law firms and in-house corporate legal teams to leap into his own thing, creating a firm that he believes can address some of the inherent weaknesses and shortcomings in traditional legal practice, weakness on both the private practice and corporate in-house side of law. The difference is Willis Commercial operates as an extension of you or your business, founded upon a relationship of mutual trust and common purpose. He's someone who approaches even the hairiest of situations with a positive vibe believing that, despite his industry, there are very few circumstances that require you to be an asshole. Ben, congratulations on launching your own thing, and I am very much looking forward to hearing your story. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thank you very much, Kim. It's lovely to see you again. It is so lovely to see you. We had to hit record eventually because I think we've been on the phone for about 40 minutes already. (laughs) I think that's in keeping with every other conversation we've ever had. So I'm glad it's still there. Exactly. Now, one to, uh, which I'm actually really looking forward to hearing the answer for, but one to kick us off. How would your lovely wife, Sandy, describe you? Well, it's a very easy question to answer because she, she did it at our wedding, in fact. I'd been designated as the speaker. I was going to come up after all the traditional speeches, et cetera, and do that groomsman speech. My wife had decided not to. Um, But then in a heartbeat on the day, she's like, you know what, I I am going to speak. Um, And the first words that came out of her mouth, she got to the lectern were, my husband is an idiot. (laughs) And from what I can gather over the last 13 years, her perspective on me hasn't changed at all. Maybe, yeah, she might put an expletive before idiot now, but but ultimately (laughs) she sees me as a bit of an idiot. But that's, of course, on the personal side. I think on the the professional side, which I'll I'll be eternally grateful for, 
yeah, she sees me as someone who's capable and someone who's able to do what I've done. And so I can honestly say that there's absolutely no way I would have done what I've done and taken that leap of faith into sort of the unknown without her support. And it was unyielding at the moment I proposed this and it's not wavered since. So idiot, number one, but in some respects professionally capable is probably the answer. Maybe we can uh, summarise that for some sort of bio as a, uh, a competent idiot. Pretty capable idiot, but it's fine. It's relatively synonymous. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay, so take me back a little bit. So before law, who were you? What was I doing? I played a lot of sport. I surfed a lot. I was passionate about football. I had a really good school upbringing. I was one of five kids, so a very big family. I was low on the totem pole as four or five, an older sister and two older brothers, so... Much of my sort of formative years were getting beaten up by my brothers. And then, you know, at the same time, having the care and wisdom of an older sister, which was lovely. I have a very loving family. You know, we're big, we're boisterous, but we're tight. And so that very much sort of characterises the way I was raised. Very active, outdoors, very family-based. But, yeah, look, I mean, I, I was pretty simple and straightforward. My wife would probably still call me pretty simple. But I... I haven't really changed too much from a personality perspective from when I was young to now. I take pleasure in the simple things. Uh, I went surfing today, for example, and that's a joy I've carried over as a kid to, to now an adult. You know, I've got arthritis in my knees now. It's one of the few things I can actually still do without keeling over. But look, I, I look back on my childhood fondly. I went through school, went to university was not well known for attending lectures at all. That didn't change across the course of multiple degrees. Wouldn't change a thing. I think there was one particular occasion I was late for a lecture because I'd been surfing and I walked in straight from the beach with dripping wet board shorts and the lecturer said, you know, are the ways good? And I pointed to my wet shorts and said, clearly. And, you know, I, I certainly saw that as something quite humorous and fun. He did not. And it was reflected in my mark halfway through that semester. But, you know, I guess... That gives a bit of a sense of who I am. I don't like to take anything too seriously. I, I've had that since I was young. I'd like to keep that for the rest of my life. I think you've got to be passionate about the stuff that matters, but I think you've got to not take life too seriously. Absolutely. I can really see a young Ben just in there dripping water all over the floor for some serious lecture on something important about law, just being like, what? It's it's the waves are up. i got to go. That's exactly it. Are you there? <laughs> You painted an excellent picture. So take me through your becoming a lawyer story. How did you get there? Were there any sidesteps along the way? My father's a doctor and my mother was a nurse and my elder siblings had all sort of gone on to different paths. My brothers had gone down the financial route and my sister was a nurse for some time and she's now gone to education. So I suppose there was not an expectation on my dad's part, but, you know, perhaps some sort of desire that maybe perhaps one of his children would follow the path down the sort of medical route. And so that was sort of a bit of interest. I'd always, I'd spent a bit of time in hospital when I was about 12 years old, I got hit by a car. So I'd had some experience being in hospital for an extended period of time and getting a bit of an understanding of the types of medical professionals that look after kids, so the paediatricians, And that was of immediate interest to me, I think when I was about sort of 19, 20, and my father had had a similar passion when he was a young doctor. So I went down that path for a while and did the medical entrance exams and things. And I don't know if you can really determine why you could call them sliding doors moments or whatnot, but you have these moments of inflection in your life where something just makes sense, where you've just got to change tack and, you know, we've worked together. Kim, you would have heard it in many pitch decks or, or meetings. You've got to pivot. And it makes me slightly nauseous to use that word, but you just pivot. And I pivoted away from becoming a doctor and actually went overseas and worked with my brother on a finance floor in London for a while. And then my now wife and I, we traveled around Europe and did all sorts of fun stuff, which was nothing to do with working. And then I realized I probably had to get a job. And one of the things I'd maintained since school was a passion for literature. And, you know, while I'd sort of pursued this medical route, I'd done some science I retained an arts degree as well because I really wanted to explore that further. And it ultimately became a pretty natural selection for me to go down a path where I could use my love of words and love of language. And anyone that listens to this that knows me is going to give me an enormous amount of shit for someone, in fact, actually emailed me today and said, is there a better way of saying this? Can you put your, you know, flowery language over it? And I was greatly offended until I realised he was right. 
but I love words. I love reading. I love expressing myself. And one of the things I really like about law, if you just sort of move away from it and move away from some of the stifling aspects of it, black letter practicing and I suppose, you know, things like legislation, the stuff that's sort of very much just sort of dry. If you think about how you practice it, it can be a beautiful thing, in my opinion. You can really express yourself. You can use words powerfully, and that's a real draw card for me. At some point, I just had this moment where I was like, I'm going to give that a go, and if it's not for me, so what? You know, I'd been sort of on this path discovery academically anyway, so I thought I've got nothing to lose. And my wife, Sandy, had been doing it already, and she loved it. And so I thought, well, why not? So I sort of found myself here now after that decision, which was probably made over a beer or something. You know, I didn't give it a great deal of thought, to be honest. Well, if we gave everything a great deal of thought, I don't think we'd get anything done. So I, I really like and resonate with that energy. And I'm going to put my visual reference of suits to the side while I ask this question, because I mean, it's a great show, but I'm sure it's not quite the real story. I'm interested in what your experience was like working then in the top tier law firms and if you can explain exactly what top tier really means. I guess the easiest explanation for top tier law firm is a really big one and there'd be sort of three or four or five even now I think where they're enormous corporate commercial law firms and they they tend to service very large clients, blue chip type clients and things like that and they can employ anywhere up to 2,000, 3,000 people. So it's a, it's a very big machine. One of the real draw cards for going into that environment, obviously, is you work with some incredibly bright people. And, you know, when I look back on my time in that environment, it, it's very much a positive experience. I learned from incredibly good people. I learned to be a really good lawyer. I didn't necessarily learn to be the lawyer I wanted to be and the lawyer I am now, but I also most certainly learned to be the lawyer I didn't want to be. And I've taken so much of the way I approach my practice of law from those days and since then had this opportunity to turn it into the way I wanted to do it. And that's sort of the most simple way of doing it. But I guess one of the most important things that came out of that environment, which is a high pressure environment, you are expected to work hard over long periods of time. And there's a lot on the line. You don't make mistakes. I suppose, and the expectation from clients, and it's quite a, a reasonable one because fees aren't small, is that the service delivery is incredibly high. Now, there's various ways you can meet that obligation. It doesn't need to be the most amount of hours, doesn't need to be the, the longest piece of advice, etc. It can be acute, it can be short and sharp, it can be interpersonal, it can be all sorts of things. And one of the great things about that environment, that top tier environment, is, and this, this happened with my graduate interview actually, was that... I'd finished sort of probably talking about myself for way too long. And this this woman that was interviewing me said, you know, I really like you, Ben, you know, and I think there's a place for you here. And you need to understand that this sort of place employs all sorts of people. You need people that are happy to be at the desk for 14, 16, 18 hours. You need people that are particularly good with clients. But you also need someone that you like having around the office that you're happy to have a beer with. And so, of course, I took that as the compliment I think it was intended to be. But I also thought, well, where does that leave me professionally? Am I going to be chained to a desk? Am I seeing clients or am I just getting pissed? At least it was that sort of nice sort of personal approach as I came into that environment. But as I said, it's very hard, high expectation. But one thing I will say is that I formed a relationship with my boss then, which I've maintained ever since, and that's somewhere in the vicinity of 10, 12, 15 years, something. And she's been my mentor ever since. And we have a, a personal relationship as well as one where we exchange you know, professional ideas, et cetera. But she doesn't cop any of my shit and any of my nonsense whatsoever. It's probably what I liked most about her. But she saw me for what I was in an environment that tends to like a particular type of employee. I was never that. And we used to have fights about business attire and, you know, I'd refuse to wear a tie and it was a mandatory thing and she'd come in the next day and say to me, where's your tie? And I said, oh, you know, I don't wear ties and you know, bring in a tie. So the next day I did bring in a tie and she, I didn't wear it. She came past and where's your tie? And I said, what's in the cupboard? And she's just exasperated. Just put on the fucking tie. And, of course, I didn't. And while I'm sure at that particular time she had no fondness for me whatsoever, I started to grow a little sort of foundation of respect in, you know, as far as I'm aware in her mind at that point that whilst I was there and to my mind performing and was willing to be part of that machine at that point in time, it wasn't going to define me. And she knew that and she saw it and she nevertheless 
supported me and drove me. So, you know, I can talk for hours, as you can tell, but the short of it is that those places exist for a reason and I respect that reason. It's not where I wanted to practice long term, but I derived a great deal of benefit from it. Oh, I'm really seeing a theme here in terms of casual band and bringing that into the work that you do. And I love a good theme. How about in-house? What brought you in-house and how does it differ? What did it teach you? So I sort of made the decision to go in-house while in that big private practice environment. Again, this particular mentor of mine, she knew and she was generous enough to expose me to types of clients and these corporates such that might be of interest. And if I'm completely honest and not talking on, on her behalf, I suspect she set me up in a way to sort of whet my appetite, so to speak, in that professional way and really get enticed towards things like media. So when I got to a point where I thought I could make a real beneficial contribution to that corporate side, I made that leap in-house. And look, at the time, it was the best thing I'd ever done. The style of working is very different. You're no longer with 99% lawyers, you're with all sorts. And that's that's actually like a, a real, I would say, mind fuck. You know, I'm trying to think, is there a better way of saying that? But it's, <laughs> no, it's it kind of like... This is completely different, completely new. It's not what I've been doing for the last nine years. How do I adapt? And then how do I perform? And that takes a little bit of time. But the best thing about in-house, and there's probably a couple of things, but the best thing about it is you meet a different type of person and you meet people with different skill sets. And one of the things that I always tried to teach the teams that I managed as sort of a general counsel in corporates was to see people across the business for them as people, but separately for the skill set they bring. I hope you're sitting down because this might shock you because some lawyers are tickheads, right? And there's a certain <laughs> level of arrogance that comes with that. Um, and you've got to temper it because you can't have someone in your team in a corporate environment if they expect to flourish and develop and grow and all those sorts of things who see someone in, let's just say, a marketing or a promotional role or something as lesser than because they're not viewed as an academically professional person, it's complete bullshit. And they bring a whole skill set that you will never have either. And that is the mindset you've got to operate with as an in-house lawyer. When you've been in that private practice context, everyone's a hypo, everyone's a lawyer, everyone's an academic, everyone is, right? You've just got some very strange personalities. But when you are working in a corporate, you're working within sort of a microcosmic environment where it's just a a small version of the world. It's a community with all sorts of people. And that was really appealing for me. I've always liked that about businesses. So when I made that transition across, I was really happy. I really liked it. I've been in corporates for a decade or so, you know, prior to making this jump. In fact, I never thought I'd go back to being a private practitioner, that's for sure. So tell me about coming to that decision. Was there anything that triggered you to do so? How did the thinking go? Give me a bit of a timeline on the decision to creating your own firm and, and how you got started. It was like 30 seconds. I um, <laughs> I was in a really fantastic position. The, the CEO of my former employer, he very generously put something on the table and off sort of a, a growth and development sort of role moving forward. And it was a good role and I think I was supposed to sign off on it in a couple of days. And my wife and I went out to lunch to celebrate and and we and we did that. You know, that was the intention. There'd been this sort of historical view. And I'm very particular about everything, really. And the way my career had gone to this point had been very well planned. I'd I'd made strategic decisions around it. I thought about it. I'd made sure I'd done everything I needed to do to make sure those things happened. Um, and, and ultimately it did. I got into a position where there was a good offer on the table of employment. That was probably where I wanted to be and it was time to, to relish in that and enjoy that and, and, and just sort of see that out. And so we went and had this lunch and we were celebrating and enjoying it and whatnot and we came home and, you know, just getting ready for bed, like benign menial things like brushing your teeth and I just had this like moment, this light bulb moment of, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. And like, it, there was like no doubt whatsoever. It wasn't stressful. It was complete release. I wasn't stressed prior to it. It was just complete. My mind just said, no, no, it's, some, it's time for something new. And so I came out of the bath and said to my wife, oh, I think I'm not going to take that role. Um, and she said, well, I don't think you can stay. And I said, no, I think I'll have to leave. She said, well, where will you go? And I said, I don't know. I don't want to work for anyone else. And she said, well, why don't you 
work for yourself and start something. I said, I think I will. And that was it. Might have even been 30 seconds, about 25 seconds. And so I had this moment where I had this complete clarity on what I didn't want to do and then went and spoke to my wife and started to form the basis of what I might want to do. But it was probably really Sandy that just clarified it to me and just said, bloody do it. Go and do this for yourself. Start it. You can do it. It was absolute faith and support. And in hindsight, if she hadn't spoken with that level of fortitude and and directness and simplicity, perhaps I would have had some more anxiety about it, but she did. And so I didn't. And so the decision-making process itself was, you wouldn't say it's on a whim, but it was on a dime. It was short, sharp and relaxed. The real stress came later. And we're going to get into that. I think it's so interesting how you describe the thunderbolt of knowing something for some reason. I think it comes in so many different ways for different people. I remember my own thunderbolt coming when I didn't have a clear path on what the future was going to be. And, and, you know, in comparison to your own story about having the role sort of laid out, Hey, this is what your future is going to look like. But I had conversations happening around, what do you, what do you want? Where do you see this going? You know, where, what, what do we need to, you know, where do you need to develop? What do you need to do? And, you know, I found myself grappling for the answers. I think it's this, I think it's this, and just not even enjoying thinking about what it might look like because I couldn't find any clarity on it. And it was only when I allowed myself to imagine not being in that role anymore, not being in that workplace anymore, that I realized it's because I don't want to be here and I just need to leave. And not being an academic professional didn't have the I know what I might do next in terms of I'm going to do it for myself. It's another thing that stops you sometimes to go, because I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm not going to make a move. And and I'm able to only think about that through you sharing your story of saying, I had this laid out and that's how I knew I didn't want it. And that's how I knew I needed to go next. Only with that clarity can I even see some of my own thinking in that. And so I just love how openly you share around that because it really does, it pings light bulbs, it pings thunderbolts. And you think, yeah, there's so many different ways you can get the ping to say, I'm not meant to have this. This isn't for me. It's something else. Do you know what's interesting about that is that I controlled everything up to that point of my career in terms of what I'd study, when I'd do it, when I'd look to seek some learning and development when you'd ask for more work, when you do all those types of things, looking to grow and, and then change employment and all those sorts of things, it's all very considered, like meticulously laid out, all planned, all strategic. Those sort of pivoting moments, there is no planning at all. Like it is an absolute slap in the face and you are unprepared for it and it's it's reactive after it just comes, particularly in my case, I've only had a few of them. And it's just from nowhere and that's it from now on. Life's changed. And I roll with it. I love it. And I love that energy so very much. So tell me about where you got started. What were your first few steps? Because in my head, I'm thinking there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of licenses, some pretty intense admin to creating said law firm. So take me back before we get into that and tell me what were your first few steps after you made this decision? It's a very bleak thing to discuss, to be honest. I will put my hand up and say administration is not my strength. And perhaps if I had known how much administration and just that sort of basic nuts and bolts you had to put together to start a business, I would have got back in there and brushed my teeth and and come back out and tried to see if a different Thunderbolt moment had come through and (laughs) knocked me out. Maybe move on to mouthwash or something. (laughs) Oh, God, anything. Look, I have this sort of tendency just to power through and get stuff done. But I will say that first leap of faith where it's all conceptual and this beautiful idea and you think it could lead to this and this and this and you start having these beautiful dreams about outcomes of what this little idea is at the moment. It's very foundational. It's it's brand new. And then you go, ah, but none of that will happen unless I actually register a name, a domain, get an email address get insurance, register myself as a company, do all that sort of stuff. And if my wife was here, she would say, I am not good at that stuff. And I still fall over. I have a lovely bookkeeper that looks after me for obvious reasons because I can't look after myself. And I think she probably sends me three or four follow-ups on everything, just not because I'm ignoring anything. I'm very attentive to emails, bits and pieces. I just, it is just not me. And there's another element to it as well, which there is an overwhelming element to stuff that one isn't what isn't natural to you. It's not a natural skill. And two, you fundamentally do not like it. 
but you can't ignore those things. And that's true of anything in life that you don't like. That's the problem with problems, right? They never go away. But the good thing is they'll be there tomorrow, so you can ignore them. You know, And that's the view I've always taken with administration, but there are obligations that you've just got to follow up. So that period of just grind was tough because it does interfere with the, I guess, the subjectivity and the dream of what you're trying to create. It makes it very real. But in that, I think there's a silver lining of positivity and education piece as well. Because with all these things, particularly when you're starting a business, in my view anyway, it does need to be grounded in pragmatism and the practical elements of it. It's one thing to say, I'm going to leave my employment and start a business. It's another thing to know what that entails. And it's not all the nice bits and pieces. It's not a client lunch. It's not getting a win with a transaction or or anything like that. Those things obviously come with hard work, but particularly when you're like me and you're starting absolutely from scratch, there's a lot of grind and that's still the case. We're a firm that's going well. We're still relatively new, but behind what you see cutaneously is is just a lot of bloody hard work and you know that, Kim. (laughs) Yeah. And I think sometimes refer to myself as a bit of a career creative. I get so caught up in what's the name, what's the brand, how does it feel? What's the tone, you know, how we write this and and, and like you, I'm a big fan of words. So how many times can I rewrite the show blurb or rewrite an about me page, you know, just to make it perfect. That stuff I lean into now when it comes to establishing a PTY or (laughs) doing anything like that. This is why I have about 45 domain names. <laughs> this is not my strong suit, the systems and processes and the admin. So I can completely relate to that. Now, it is really that whole other kettle of fish when it's your own thing, because I find it's not just a business. It's never a business, no matter what you do, regardless of what the business is, it's an extension of you in some form. So I'm interested in how you incorporated your, we'll call it your unique bendness into Willis Commercial. A unique bendness. I love the way creative people, and we obviously work together and had other colleagues, you come up with these amazing ways of extrapolating concepts, but putting them in this, I see, I'd say that's flowery language, you know, it's not on me here for once, but you know, it was like ideation and all sorts of stuff. And I, I love it. Uh, anyway, that's a side note. We well, just saw a small window into some business, which is sort of little tangents here and there, enjoying words, enjoying a chat. The way I actually came up with the concept for my business was to have me at the core of it, to be quite honest. I think what I saw from where I'd come from in various ways of practicing law and sort of prior practice corporate side is that, yes, you can be yourself to an extent and practice in particular ways and have your own style and those types of things, but you're nevertheless hamstrung by the spirit and the character of whoever you're working for. And, you know, you spend most of the time trying not to do the wrong thing, let alone expressing yourself. And so one of, one of the sort of key aspects of starting my business was to have me at its core and you take it or leave it, right? Um, but the idea was to be me and to not shy away from that. And we went through various iterations of, of a name for the business and decided to have my name in it because I was willing to take that on and have your name associated with your work publicly and all those sorts of things because I wanted to own it. And that's a good and bad thing. So that was the starting point coming up with a name that was sort of imbued with who who I am, which is my name, right? Really simple, black and white. Then it was about how am I actually going to offer a service to clients where it's beneficial to them and I can be myself and express myself. And the skill set I have is a very broad one. It's very much a general counsel corporate type set of skills. And I thought, well, why not start a business where I can look after only a few clients, really, like a relatively small client book and Be a high touch with them. Don't just look at a contract maybe once or twice a year, but otherwise not really have a a relationship with them. I thought, why don't I use what I believe to be pretty good sort of interpersonal skills and build relationships with clients and embed with them and not get in bed with them, like embed, like (laughs) E-M-B-E-D, and then grow with them. And with any luck, we establish this really strong rapport of trust and we actually like each other. And then we spend years together and both of our businesses grow and both of our businesses benefited by that. And so I think the bendness is I just approach every client engagement the same way. I don't expect potential clients necessarily to like that or to use me, but I'm confident that if I'm myself and I project what my business can offer you as a potential client and you like it, then we're going to work well together. 
and I don't pretend to be anybody else. I don't think there's any longevity in that in a professional relationship. I don't think it's as fun. I'm probably sick of trying to come up with a personal or professional Ben. You know, I, I much prefer just Ben Ben. And my clients would say this, I think that that's what they get. So yeah, I mean, I guess part of the anxiety of starting my business was precisely that as well, because I was the heart of it and the face of it. And that drives me and I'm really proud of that. But that's the vulnerability of it as well. Yeah, I hit quite a nerve there uh, in myself by talking about how much you put yourself in, into what you do. And I love how you've described really embracing the parts of you that make you unique. You know, I've said this before on podcasts and had the feedback from, from where very well-meaning people over my corporate career that I am someone who expresses my emotions significantly. <laughs> you get the gamut, you get the full gamut, you get the highs, you get the lows, you get everything in between. If someone's been a dickhead, I'm going to say you've been a dickhead. If something's bullshit, I'm going to call it out. And it's something about myself that I, I developed a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about, you know, being told maybe it's too much. Maybe I should dial it down if I want to be, you know, really successful. And it took me a little bit of a long time to get over that chip and just go, no, do you know what that is? Whatever your uniqueness is, whatever it is about you, you inherently do. That's the thing you've got to lean into. But that's why the podcast is called Unemployed and Afraid. You know, straight out. That's how it is. That's I'm shit myself every day. Terrified, totally untethered, totally not tied to anybody, not employed by anybody, self-employed here, <laughs> just freaking out. And that's the whole, you know, purpose of this pod as well is to give you the realness of it because the realness is who I am. So, you know, I think for, for anyone starting a business and looking to be a business person when you're going into it as well, being the picture of who you think you should be as the person who runs that business you want to create, that changes a, an inherent aspect of you. No take a step back and embrace who you are because you'll never be truly happy in it anyway if you try to change that about yourself. Just find the thing where you can be you and bloody go for it. So I think it's a really, really important point that you bring up. But that's when you can be the most strong too because when you prepare for meetings and you prepare for presentations and things when you're, you know, a little bit younger in roles, you shit yourself and you write these things to sound a certain way and to speak to that audience and what they want to hear and then you get nervous because he's like, this isn't actually me, but it's what I think I'm supposed to do in this environment. And no one likes doing that kind of public speaking where it's form fit for expectation rather than, yes, there's sort of a, a rough ideology here. You've got to sort of meet a mark, but really do it your own way. But you do it your own way. You don't stress out because ultimately it's like me just shooting the shit with you today. Like I've got nothing prepared. Like God forbid that did. But you, you just talk. I'm not holding back. I'm happy to be vulnerable. And within that, you find some confidence because really you're just speaking and that's easy. But that exposure part you touched on before around putting yourself out there when you start these business also stuff, that bit's the fun bit for me. You know, I actually like having that sort of rubber on the road and being right on the line and that little bit of stress, a little bit of anxiety. There are sometimes, let's be honest, I don't enjoy it. But for the most part, that's the motivation. That's fun, that bit, because the wins are mine. And so is the grind and so are the bits when it's not going so well and whatever, but the wins are mine. I did that. It's as simple as that. Oh, love it. So hit me with one of your wins. Tell me about your first client, how you found them, how it went. If you can, naturally. I mean, I'm conscious I'm talking to a lawyer here, so we don't need to give, we don't, yeah, so we don't need to give names. <laughs> it's really lucky, actually, because one of my foundational clients I'd known across industry, and I had a meeting with them very much around the time I'd sort of left employment. And I approached them with an idea. And I will say this going back a step I don't pitch, I don't sell. I don't do any of that. I'm lucky to have a good network of ex-colleagues and friends and peers and, and whatnot. And word gets out, right? Word gets out that you've started something. I don't, I've never liked that sort of sliminess of pitching and selling, particularly to people you know. It makes me uncomfortable. So I, so I don't. What I do do, though, is instigate conversations with people that there's a possibility of something, but I'll never go there verbally, but there's a possibility of something. But it's more for me about establishing a, a conversation and should that peak their interests and they raise it, then great, but I never will. And this particular example is going to entirely contradict that. So what I sort of did was the first part that I just sort of rambled on about to establish a context where a conversation might happen and might lead to somewhere. And this is all genuine, but 
I actually use it as an opportunity to learn and lean on this particular person from a bit of a mentoring perspective because I had a great deal of respect for what they'd achieved. They're particularly entrepreneurial. In my mind, I thought they'd probably respect the fact that I was just giving it a go. So we sat down and had a bite to eat. He said, you know, so why are we here? After sort of a bit of a gas bag. And I said, it's fair enough. I just sort of said, I've left my employment. I'm going to start my own thing. And he cut me off and stood up and, and shook my hand and said, congratulations, I've got a great deal of respect for anyone that just has a go, takes that leap of faith, takes that risk and just goes. Can I ask you something? In that moment, was there any part of you that thought he was about to leave? <laughs> yes, <laughs> which would have been unfair too because I, I hadn't really got into my spiel yet. I was like, I've got so much gold to come. Please continue. I just, it was a thought I had for a while, a split second when you said that. I was like, oh, God. No, the thought crossed <laughs> so my please, mind. Yes. And I'm really glad it didn't because it was quite an expensive restaurant and he was very kind enough to get the bill too. So I would have been left holding the invoice. You know, we then sat down and he sort of said, well, lay it on me. What, you know, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? And he pushed me. He pushed me on the bits and pieces that I probably wasn't aware of yet, that the risks are involved, not in a way to dissuade me from the decision, but more to suss out if I'd really thought it through. And so I'll be endlessly grateful for that conversation because it was everything I needed and far more. And I don't know whether it's because he had people do this with him in the past or whether he was kind enough to take a particular interest in me and what I was doing, but he got it. You know, I said to him, I said, I want to start a business that's different to the type of law I've practiced over my whole career. I don't want to be a traditional private practitioner. I want to grow on the skills that I had in a corporate environment. I want to be able to bring a set of services that understands what my corporate clients need because I've been there and I want to deliver them through me basically. And he really liked the idea and he pushed me on it. And I think we basically left on terms of another handshake. He was still there and he effectively just said, we'll do business. And that was the first one and we still do. And it came through this lovely engagement of, of mentorship, I suppose, is a good way of putting it. So I was really lucky in that respect. It wasn't sort of a, I've got zero clients and I had my first conversation. And I was hoping to get somewhere with and was kicked in the teeth. Like I was very fortunate to get that straight up. And I think part of that's having worked really hard for a long period of time beforehand. You just have some people in your network that know where your trajectory is going and those types of things. They know you work hard. They know you're honest. They know you're genuine. So when you do have those open conversations, they know they're getting what is true and real about you. So yeah, my first client was actually a very positive story. And how do you know for your future clients if they're a fit? Do you have a little bit of a checklist or, or things that, you know, help you find that that perfect fit? Yeah, it's an ODICAD policy. <laughs> you know, you just... The best policy. And, and no doubt they have the same one that they apply to me. You know, I think you... One of, the, one of the real benefits, if you look at starting your own business and you go, I've got all these positives and I've got bloody admin and I've got risk, those things will always be there. But what you really do, which is a great benefit, and I love this about it, is you can choose to work with whoever you want. And I want to work with clients that they've got a service or a product that I really believe in. I see a future for us having a relationship where we can really sort of combine and grow that product and service from, you know, working both ways moving forward. And fundamentally, I, I like them as a person, whether it's a, a client or a client business, those sorts of things. I can actually happily pick up my phone. And just for the record, I don't like my phone ringing. It's always on silent. I do not like banging on the phone. And when the phone rings, I'm loath to pick it up. But my client list, I'll answer all of them at any time, whenever, don't mind, because I've handpicked them all. And yeah, I guess that's sort of it, I suppose. That's the criteria. Good person, good product. Can we have fun together? Can we grow together? And I guess the other one as well is that can I be a good lawyer? You know, am I the right person for you? And if I'm not, I'm very happy to say, no, no, I think you should use this person instead. And I think that's a skill in itself. But yeah, it's all relationship based. Are we a good fit or not? Tell me about the role that women have played in your development over your career. Oh, it's massive. Basically, all my bosses, my direct managers of influence, particularly in the senior years, have been women. And, you know, I touched on it earlier. Over the course of my entire career, the mentor I've had since being a lawyer back in private practice, she was hugely influential and she still is. She, like my wife, I had a conversation with her prior to making this decision and, and going out on my own. I had a conversation with her and, and she was wholly supportive straight away. 
wasn't an inkling of negativity, no cynicism, nothing at all. She asked really calculated, clever questions around my intent and how I was going to execute and all those sorts of things, but nothing but support. And I think that comes from a couple of things, one of which is I think she does have some faith and trust in my capabilities, but it's also been the fact that she's been there as a constant support for so long now that she knows I have that capability. You know, she knows I can do it because she's seen me do it before. I have a huge debt of gratitude to pay her. I wouldn't know how to do that. I wouldn't know how to articulate it, which is patently obvious now that you've asked this question. But she's influenced my career. I could be more than, than anybody else. And then I've had several other women sort of in that period of time since that have been in senior positions that have either pushed me from a technical skill perspective or they've taught me other things like soft skills and said, you know, you come in like a bloody, I've got Ram Road in my head. I don't, I, that's not a thing. Bullet like, a gate. Ram <laughs> Road or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? You know, sometimes that is effective, probably in a really specific, unique, very unusual, very rare legal circumstance. But for the most part, particularly when you're in corporate, it's all about soft skill. And you've got to develop an ability to hold the attention of your audience and deliver a message that the audience will understand and hold on to without sounding like a lawyer, to be honest. And this particular woman taught me a lot about that. And there's a huge power in, in that. And it is not manipulation. It's it's understanding how best to get across your, your message. So those two women in particular, but, but there's been others along the way, have easily been the biggest influences on me professionally. Where do you hope to see this business grow to? It depends how many wines I've had. <laughs> I think at the beginning when you start with a dream and an idea and a concept, you probably forecast something quite grandiose. I did anyway. Then you get into the reality of running a business and you start to understand that you may not have just invented Google and you you, you (laughs) may need to work pretty hard for a while. And so I've taken a step back from where it's going to end up being and really focused on what it is. And I think if you can look at the foundations of what the business is and what it stands for, then the future outcome will take care of itself. And one of the things I've certainly learned across the course of my career and watching my wife have a career while also having babies is it's undeniable the challenges that women have still to this day in being able to, to be a mother, but just dealing with what historically has been structures that are just inequitable. I've got this fantastic opportunity now to have a business that's working ground floor up to stand for things that are nothing to do with that historical inequity and from scratch have something that's just openly and transparently equal. Yeah, and that's just one example, but my focus really has become more foundational in future. And I think the future will figure itself out off the back of that. Yeah, I love that. I feel like you're touching on there a little bit is when we do start our business, many of us start commercially minded. I'm going to make money from this. And there are some, and I love them. There are some wonderfully passionate people who are creating businesses out of the passion and the money is, you know, it's later, it's later. But you often, we do, I'm a commercial entity person myself, you start thinking this is going to be able to financially support me in the way I really hope to be supported. And you start with that in mind. And then your business starts to teach you things that you weren't prepared for. And it starts to teach you lessons. It humbles you. It shows you things about yourself you would never have discovered without the business. It becomes a living, breathing thing and just takes you on such a journey and really shows you what it's going to be. And you, know, you just kind of got to strap in and then hold on and go with it and see what happens. And I just, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point to land on because I think a lot of us don't realise it. I don't think any of us realise it when we start how much our business is going to change once we get into it. I think you're forced to answer questions that perhaps you can avoid when you work in a big business. you have relatively in the shadows to an extent. You know, you take, for instance, something like diversity, whatever, and, and you look at broad corporate themes around ESG and these things these days and does a business stand for something or does it not? And as an employee, that's a business decision. It's a executive, it's a CEO decision. Do they conspicuously go out and support a particular concept or do they stay quiet or do they say something not supporting it? Employee, you're safe from that debate and that's fine, right? If you start something, you may be called upon at one point in time to say, what does your business stand for? And it happens. 
And what are you going to do? You've got to make a decision. You've got to voice an opinion. And if you don't, that can be looked unfavorably as well. So you put in that position of test and you need to respond. Quite honestly, I, I quite enjoy that. We went to a school interview for my daughter recently and, and she said, I'm, I'm quite nervous. And even my wife was sort of quite nervous. She's not an interview type person. And my daughter looked at me and said, are you nervous, dad? And I was like, no, not at all. I said, I love this stuff. You know, interviews are the best. And I said, you just get this opportunity where there's this inherent tension and everyone's kind of tense in there, but I always really enjoy it. And I do. Is that weird? Not at all. And any of my future podcast guests who are not comfortable with being interviewed, please heed this lesson. There is so much gold in being interviewed and being asked a question and being forced essentially to figure out what your opinion is and to make a stand on it and to put it out there. It's a pretty rare time when you get that opportunity. So I, I get it. I love being interviewed because I learn things about myself every time my mouth opens. So, oh, Ooh, who knew? No, who knew I felt that way? No, I good. know, but the editing process is going to be so important with this one, Kim. <laughs> Not at all. I need to redline it, you know? Pull out the full legal set of skills. No, no, redacted. <laughs> there are no tracked changes on this recording. <laughs> oh, no. My final question to you, Ben, is, I mean, you've shared so much wonderful insight as I knew you would uh, as soon as I reached out to you asking to have this conversation. I knew you would be somebody who doesn't just take the business of business building at face value, but who takes it with the whole gamut of vibes that it brings to you, the experiences, the feelings and everything that comes with it. And you've absolutely delivered on that. So thank you for sharing your story with me today. My final question to you is going to be, how can the listener and I support you to keep growing? What can we do for you? I must admit, I wasn't expecting that. I've got this sort of obsessive personality in my mind where I just anticipate everything that's coming, right? And that's probably why I, I'm this weirdo that enjoys going to work interviews because I I do think it's a bit of a skill to try and speculate and have some sort of foresight into what you're going to be asked. I was not expecting that question. I don't know. Have some bendness. If you can take that and make it your own, and let's be honest, like Ben is, is clearly a nebulous concept of nonsense, but if we distill it down into being you in, in how you approach things, maybe I'd like to see more people do that. And that doesn't necessarily help me, but it might help you have the confidence to take a leap of faith and find your own core and just go for it. Maybe that helps me in, in a way that just makes me feel good about myself. So I think that answers the question to some extent. Why did you ask me this question? I have absolutely no idea. I'm <laughs> rambling here. I don't know. How can I help you, Kim? I think you've just helped me by being on my podcast and teaching me some things I didn't know about you and showing me some things about myself I didn't realize either. So I think it's actually a perfect answer to that question is to take that advice that who you are is perfect and lean into it and create the thing that's going to give you the kind of life that you want to have. It is the perfect thing that the listener and I can, can go and do. And of course, if anybody happens to need your services and or could refer some fantastic people to you, I'll make sure that I've got the link to your website in the show notes, your LinkedIn as well, so they can get around you and uh, just stay in touch with you. Any lawyers out there that might need some mentoring, I have a feeling you might get some messages. So <laughs> we'll make sure to put all of those in the show notes. Ben, as always, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. I feel grateful for having heard and experienced a little bit of that ben that I have missed over the the last few years and I wish you nothing but the best on this journey. Thank you very much, Kim. I've loved it. One quick thing. If you're hearing this, you've listened all the way through. Hopefully that means you really like this podcast because it's pretty generous to give up 40 odd minutes of your time for it. If that is the case, please leave the show a star rating and a review. It helps me reach so many more people who might also listen all the way through and get some benefit and some support out of it. Not to mention it puts a real spring in my step to read them. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the stories of starting over with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid. See you there.